you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to uh, the book of Jude. Um, it's weird not saying a chapter. You know, you naturally you just want to say Jude chapter, and I realize that there's no chapter one, there's no chapter two, it's just one little long letter. Uh, but if you're with me this morning, I want, I want you to turn to Jude with me. Uh, we're starting a really short series for the next couple of weeks um, over, over this little letter that I think is uh, impactful, and, and it packs a lot in just a short little time. Um, you know, it's funny because it, it's natural as, as we want to kind of, we place all this emphasis on reading the Bible. And, and, and really, you know, being in the Scriptures daily is, is a great thing. Um, but some of you, if you're overachievers, you like to pick the books that you can read all at once. You know, like, I want to sit down and let, let me read something so I can, like, feel accomplished, right? Because as soon as you finish a book of the Bible, you, you feel that little bit of accomplishment and, you know, you want to keep going. So as a kid, you know, books like Jude were my favorite. Because I could sit there, or like Titus, I could just sit there and I could read real quickly and I could say, hey, I, I finished a book, Right? But, you know, it's, it's, it's funny as you grow up and, and as you start to understand more about the Scripture and what it has to offer and some of the things that are going on, how much can be packed in just a short amount of time. Um, and, and this is one of those letters. And, and I, I love the letters of the New Testament because they give us this insight to the early church as you understand why the author wrote it. Uh, why did someone take time to write a letter? You know, writing a letter in the first century was not like writing a letter today. Um, I can sit down and I can write a letter and I can put it into an envelope and I can address it to you and I can have it at the post office all in less than 30 minutes if I really wanted to. But you know, in, in the first century to write a letter, you, know, you would have to sit down and you'd have to find a pen and paper that wasn't readily accessible. And for some people, you'd have to have it dictated because you, if you didn't know how to write... Uh, you'd have to have someone else write for you. And then you would have to have it sent, and that sending wouldn't go to a post office and then be processed and flown across the country overnight and then sent to the right place. It would be carried by one person to maybe the shore, and the, somebody would carry it in a boat over to another you know, area, and they would carry it to the right place. It was, a, it was this long, tedious process. And so, you know, when, when you'd write a letter in the first century to someone you knew, you might write it today, and it might get there a few months from now. And so much may change in those few months. You know, Paul would, Paul would usually write letters to the churches that he had helped start. And we only have a few of those letters in our Scripture today. But he would write them to churches that he knew were struggling with different things. And Jude is a lot similar. If you have your Bible with you, and you're in Jude... If I can keep it open. You know, Jude starts out with this. He says, he says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. you know, there's a lot we don't know about Jude, but there's a lot we can speculate. We believe Jude um, might have been one of the half-brothers of Jesus. You know, he recognizes himself as Jude, the brother of James. So we, we have this author who gives himself of some account and tells us that, that he's writing this, and I, I find it interesting that he calls himself a brother of James and not a brother of Jesus, if he is. But he calls himself a servant of Jesus. He, he's writing to this church and saying, hey, I'm just like you. I, I'm, I'm a servant of Jesus just like you. And he He's coming at this, and we think, based off of what we read, that he's writing to um, a Messianic Jewish community, a community, a church that believes in Jesus who were Jews at one time. And so he's writing this letter, and he, and he starts out this way, and I think it's really interesting. He calls them, he says, he says to those who are called. He says, to those who are called, Os Guinness wrote that, you know, this, this to those who are called is, is a mean of salvation. He's saying to those who God has called out, the followers of Jesus. That's still us today. Those who've been called out, the church, that, the word that we have for church in the New Testament, um, the Greek word is ekklesia, and it means to those who are called out. The, the church is to those who have been called out by God who are in Christ. And he says that to those who are beloved in God the Father. 
Brennan Manning wrote this, that you know, it reminds us that God has a single relentless stance toward us, and that is that he loves us. That to those of us who are beloved in God, that God's relentless single stance toward us is that he loves us. And Jude reminds the church that we're kept in Christ. And that's, I think, one of the most important for this letter that we're going to read, especially as we see next week. That to those who are kept in Christ means that, that we are held in the custody that we're watched over by Jesus. That the church, we don't just exist, but that Christ who loves us and who has called us and, the God, and our God who loves us, that He also keeps us, He guards us in Christ. And the Spirit inside of us would, would hold us in Christ and bind us together that we might not just easily slip away. This is how he opens his letter. He goes on and he says, Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, excuse me, I found it necessary to write to you, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. But certain people have crept in unnoticed for long ago, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God in sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Jude opens up by saying, listen, I wanted to write to you. I, I, I got ready to write about our common salvation, which I think we would all love to hear a letter on, right? Um, it seems like so much of the letters in the New Testament are these negative things that really are based off of the wrongs that are going on in the church and sometimes it's, it would be nice to just read a letter in the New Testament that's all about our grace and salvation, right? It's just to read that, that little bit of, you know, boost. But he says, listen, I, I wanted to write to you about that, but here's what I'm writing to you about. And th this is, the, this is the, the letter right here in a nutshell, that he has written to the church to contend for the faith. He's written that there is these people who have crept into the church, that crept into the church unnoticed for so long are those who would, as he says later, pervert the gospel and the grace of our Jesus Christ. He said, but I'm writing to you that you might contend, that you might struggle, that you might fight for the faith that is in Jesus Christ. See, what Jude is writing is this letter that says something is going on. And I, I believe the reason we still have this letter is because these things have continued to go on. He says, but I'm writing to you that you might fight for the faith in Jesus. That, that we have this beautiful thing called the church. That Jesus has come and that he is the fulfillment of the scriptures that you read and that he's died for us and that he's come to wash away our sins so that we could be in relationship to God in this intimate way but crept into the church has been those who want to teach falsely. That, that, crept, that what's crept into the church is ways and in, in, in ideologies that, that pervert the grace of God. And so he says, I want you to fight for the gospel. I want you to fight for this gospel that you've been given. And he says what it is is that there are people that have crept into the church, and I love this language that he uses. That they've crept in unnoticed. You know, almost like one of those mice that you guys caught in, um, on vacation. Um, or those little, little scurrying field mice that come in around the fall because they don't want to be outside anymore and they think that your home is, you know, something to be taken advantage of. Well, they don't pay the light bill. Um, not that we've had any of those ourselves. They've crept in unnoticed, and he says that they pervert the grace of God. And it's almost as if they do it to, to have a license for, for grace and immortality. You know, that they use this as a license of grace. You know, it's really funny when we talk about it that way, because even Paul makes this notion that, well, we have grace so that since we have grace, should we go on sinning? I mean, I mean, if we have grace that's abundant and you know, God will forgive us if we do this or that. We can just keep doing the things that we've done, right? Well, Paul says, by no means. And so Jude is saying that some of those have crept into the church as well. 
And this is Jude's way of, of saying some of the same things that Paul says to the church, that by no means should grace be this license of sin, right? Grace isn't a card that we can, you know, sin and then we can just swipe it and you know, the sins will be forgiven and we can just go on and do it over and over again and just keep racking up the grace points. It, it doesn't work like that. And Jude is saying that the same thing has slipped into the church that he's writing to. That false teachers have arisen that want to teach different doctrines that some of them are probably even teaching this idea that we can just go on sinning. Because if, if Jesus' blood of forgiveness can cover anything, then why should it stop us from doing anything? And so, so he comes out and he says, but this is something that we're going to have to fight against. And the thing that we're going to notice through, throughout Jude and that we, we notice in, in the church today is that we have to be on our guard to know what is false and what's true. You know, and, and I think it's interesting because that's really what we're doing today, right? Um, I, I noticed that to this week that there is a, now a website um, called factcheck.org because that's what we're into, right? We, we want to know what's true and what's not. We, we need somebody to tell us what's right and what's wrong because here's the thing. If, if we just rely on the church to tell us what's right and what's wrong, and we don't think about these things ourselves and ponder the truth of God in our own heart to know what's right and what's wrong. We will look to the church as something like that. You know, the church is truthaboutgod.org. And I can just go to that and they'll tell me, like Snopes will tell me if this story is true or false. And I don't have to go any further. And I don't have to dig into it myself. And then I can just know what's right and what's wrong. But that's how false teachers creep in. When we look to one place or one single authority that's not Jesus to tell us what's right and what's wrong, what's true and what's false, we start getting doses of whatever somebody wants to tell us. And then really that, that website of the church just becomes Wikipedia where anyone can add to or take away. And that's how false teaching creeps in. Is really we don't know. We, we come to a point where we don't know really what's right and what's wrong. It's just whatever somebody wants to tell us. So one person might come in and tell you that this, this right here is the truth. Somebody else might come along and tell you, well, actually, this is the truth. And unless we know what's, what's true, we will be swayed one way or the other. And Paul even warns Timothy that Timothy, that, that will happen in the church. That people will want to listen to what their itching ears want to hear. And they will be swayed back and forth by whatever wind comes and goes. And so because, because of this, you might believe that. But something else comes along and it sounds even more impactful. And I've seen this happen for the, through the church probably since college. I've noticed it. That whatever we want to hear, whatever sounds best to us, Sounds good, and I can check in with that, and I can, you know, recognize with these people, and I'll ostracize these people. And here we are, and I think that really we're at that point ourselves. Because we've, we've allowed different things to tell us what's right. And we want to identify right with a certain people group or with a certain belief system instead of knowing what's right and what's wrong and taking from that and saying, you know what, I can... I can agree with you here, but I'm not going to agree with you here because that's just not the truth. And Jude gives us the answer for how we deal with that. And the way we deal with that is to contend for the faith. And we contend for the faith by knowing the truth. We don't give in to those who've crept in just so that they can pervert the gospel. Move on to verse 5. Jude says, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality, and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Wow, that's a lot. 
And if you're like me, you might have read that and you might have wanted to like rub your eyes a little bit and go, so what's going on here? You see, this is how we know that Jude really is writing to a group of people who are Jews because he's telling these stories of old. He's coming back and he's telling them things that they probably know. Things that, well, you would know if you had been raised in these scriptures. These are stories that are fresh in their minds because they understand them. But he's telling them these stories because as we'll see moving on, that he's using stories of rebellion in the past to show what is going to happen again. So he's, he's told the church that I wanted to write to you about our common salvation, but now I've got to write to you about this issue that's going on in the church. And he says, if you don't believe me, just look at the past. If you don't believe that, well, that, that this is what's going to happen, let me show you from the past. And he brings up the story of the Exodus. And he says, look, just as God once condemned a nation of people who didn't believe and freed his people out of slavery... God too will do it again. That, that for those who want to, to hold the church in captivity of well, heresy, he says, let me show you that God can still free his people. He goes on, he says, in a like manner, these people also relying on their dreams defile the flesh, reject authority and blaspheme the gospel, blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to announce blasphemous judgment, but he said, The Lord rebuke you. But those people blaspheme all they do not understand. And destroyed by all, they are like unreasoning animals, understanding instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of going to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds sweeping along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. You see, he brings up a lot of stories. Some of them are unfamiliar. You see, a couple of these stories that he's bringing out are from what would have been extra-biblical texts. But stories that they would have understood because they would have been, as first century Jews would have been told. And so he, he comes out with all of these what almost seem random strings of stories. But he's coming out with them for a purpose. Because he's saying, listen, all of these people at one time blasphemed God by looking to evil. Looked to rebel against God. He, he, he brings out Balaam and his donkey, one of the wildest stories in the Old Testament. The only time we ever hear of an animal speaking. And then he brings out Sodom and Gomorrah and he brings out Cain. He's showing that all of these people at one time rebelled against God. Because as he says in verse 8, they relied on something that they thought would be greater than God and that's their own dreams. They relied on that which to them was better than God, and it wasn't enough. And so he says, heed these as warnings. These errors of rebellion, that if they continue in the church, they'll go down in history like all the other rebellions once did. And he goes on to verse 14 and he says, It was also about these that Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds. For ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way 
and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These are grumblers. Following their own sinful desires, they are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism and gain of advantage. He uses First Enoch to make the point that as believers, we have to fight for and defend the truth of our faith. That for the ungodly teachers, a time is coming that God will bring His judgment. And judgment that if they fail to repent, won't turn out well. And the truth is, that a time of judgment will come. That Jesus will come back and all will have to answer to what has happened. It's funny because James even tells us that you think you want to be a teacher, but you might want to take a second guess because all those who teach with authority the Word of God will answer to God a judgment that will be harsher. And Judah's warning that, that false teachers have crept into God's church to pervert the gospel of grace. But one day a judgment will come. And, and here comes the, the point of this and why this is important for the church. You know, a lot in the church have, have tried to be what I would call heresy hunters. They want to hunt out that which is false and just almost smash it and take care of it. You know, but I read this article about this pastor who decided to take a different approach and say instead of looking out for those who've you know, given into heresy, I'm going to look for those who've given into heresy so that I can teach them the true gospel so they can be healed, can be healed from it. And so he turned himself from what he called a heresy hunter into a heresy healer. And the reason why is because if we believe that this judgment is coming, if we believe that a time is coming where God is going to take care of rebellion forever, then we want to be those who help bring people along to the truth. So they're not subject to the judgment and wrath, but they're subject to they're subject to the love of God. And so as a church, we need to be looking out for the truth. We need to know what truth is and we need to have the truth of God stored in our heart so that when we see that which is wrong and we see the evil and the rebellion, we want to take on those who've given in so that they can give in to Christ instead. That's why we exist as a church. It's to bring those along to the grace of God, not to send those to the depths of hell. Why, why do we seek to know the truth? Why do we seek to, to hide God's word in our heart just so that we can know a few facts, but instead it's so that those, so all would know. And so that when we find those in the church who've creeped in, that they would, they would come to know the truth and that they wouldn't instead teach that which is wrong. I read this story about a doctor it's, it's a hypothetical story about, you know, imagine a doctor goes into a refugee camp and he finds a, a, a man, an old man, lying on a cot and the, the old man is, is half naked, shivering and struggling to keep warm and he's under this, this threadbare blanket and, and you can see that the, the blanket is ridden with dirt and grime and even feces and the doctor comes in and he snatches the blanket away and says, well, don't you know this blanket's what's making you sick? So he throws off the blanket and he, he leaves and says, well, my job is done. Well, he might have helped the man get out from under a blanket that might have been making him sick, but he also just made a cold man even colder. And the truth is, if we just want to go out hunting for what's wrong and just try to get rid of it like it's garbage and we... You know, like some churches love to do, find that which is wrong and throw it out. Well, have we really accomplished the goal? Well, all we've done is just send someone away with what they think is truth to just go infiltrate something else. But instead, 
We've got to offer the actual blanket. That which is right so that we can help heal that which is wrong. And so, this letter, and we're going to read next week as we continue in Jude, how God is going to intend through us to help preserve us from these things, but also help give us the truth so that we can help preserve others. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we thank You for this time to come together and we pray that, Lord, You would help us learn that which is true. That we would hide Your Word deep in our hearts so that we would know for a fact what's right and what's wrong, but not just that, but that we would be able to teach those who've gone astray. And so we pray, Lord, that you would turn our hearts and bend it toward your truth so that we could know you better. We love you and give thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen.